Don't be emo. Don't like that. Hello and welcome to the China podcast. I know it's been five months, but Jesus, Eric, you've changed. You're looking well. I had a sex change. Oh yeah, was it painful? It feels liberating. So what do we call you now? You can call me Han. Are you still as big a dickhead as always? No, I have a vagina now, and that makes me smart. So should we all go shopping for vaginas? Actually, you know what? The place I went to, they have a deal: two genitals for the price of one. So it's worth it. You can save money. Can you imagine going to a sex change clinic and saying, "Two vaginas, please"? Where would you put two vaginas? Vaginas instead of ears. How about a penis instead of a nose? Here, can you pass me a tissue? I need to blow my penis. You would look like Pinocchio. I would. I would look like Pinocchio. Every time you see a hot girl outside, your penis nose would grow longer. Oh, you you get in trouble for for that here. You get in trouble from that anywhere. That is true. Especially if the girl is under eighteen. What what sort of a sordid podcast is this? Right, let's climb back out of this sexually perverted rabbit hole we've ventured into. And first thing, you're not Eric.、Uh, you never were Eric. You're Han, and you have always been Han. Yes, I'm Han. And remember that, listeners, because you're going to be hearing a lot more from Han from now on. But Eric's not going away. Two are becoming three. So a threesome. Okay, a threesome it is. I don't want to encroach on you guys. It was his idea. Eric's idea, yeah. Yeah, we were sitting in shots. That's our local bar, by the way.、Um, the night before all of this went tits up here with lockdown, and he said, "Let's get Han on board," and I agreed with him because for a long time we'd been mulling on how to spice up the podcast a little bit, and. You know, really, how to reinvent ourselves? Not because it was going stale or anything, but because we felt it needed that little bit more panache. All right, and then, and then we both had some flaming absence, and、uh, I went home and collapsed on the couch.、Um, but no, 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 no. We both agreed to have a local voice involved, which would give the podcast a new dynamic. And because you're part of the local comedy circuit and you have experience with the spoken word, as well as having a unique spin on all things, we both felt that this made sense. But Eric's not available to record today.、Um, yeah, for some unknown reason,、uh, the mysterious man. So it's just you and me in our brand new studio. We've got a new table. Some nice new decor, and it looks the part. Where did you guys record before? We did it out of his、uh, dining area. It was it was grand, you know. But this is better.、Um, this is the kind of space we wanted to get eventually.、Um, you do your techno in here.、Um, why don't you tell our listeners something about that? Yeah, sure.、Uh, I think on the one hand, I am pretty happy that. Uh, I'm doing something which I'm really passionate about, but on the other hand,、uh, it's really hard to have a nice night out because there are not so much clubs playing underground techno. Which yeah. personally, I, yeah, I really, I am really into that. I kind of like. I like how techno fits into the whole cyberpunk vibe of Chongqing.、Um, is there much of an audience for it here? I would say there are more audience、uh, compared to six years ago, and it's growing, but it's not a major thing here. Yeah, like the are there many clubs? Like how many clubs do you think you could could?、Uh, there are a few clubs,、uh, Echo Bay, Nuts Club, and、uh, they also have a club before, but now、yeah. uh, they shut it down、uh, yeah. due to the pandemic. And this is in a city of ten million people, so it's it's really not that much. Yeah, it's not. Yeah,、um, and as I said, you're part of the comedy scene with me too.、Um, that's a that's good crack,、it's、good fun, isn't it? It's good fun sometimes, especially when you're on the stage 
and you are really into your performing. And when you look at the audience, they are they are also they are paying attention to you. And sometimes when you are done your set, people will walk to you and say, "Oh, I like your set. I get your jokes." Do you like Dog Day Afternoon? Not really. I think the movie is kind of dry and it does hurt your feelings. Yeah, Eric likes Dog Day Afternoon. Well, then I don't think me and him are going to get along. Oh no, we've gone from an innocent threesome to a vicious love triangle. Things might get tense. People like drama. You might be right. Um, it could be good for our weekly listens. So we have lots to cover today. We're going to chat lockdown, A4 paper, and smart technology as a means of organization and protest. Yeah, there's much to unpack.、Um, but before we dive right into it, I feel I need to explain why we haven't recorded an episode in so long. Our last one was titled、uh, "Magical Penis Wine." And that was our most popular episode, in fact. And in it, we said that I'd carry on for the for the summer solo while Eric was away,、um, but I didn't. I said to him that night in the bar when we were talking about it that I just didn't feel right doing one without him. Is he like the brains of the operation?、Um, whatever you do, don't feed his ego. This podcast was founded on equality, and I'll have none of this Axel Rose like megalomania. I agree. That might only end with someone being stabbed in the back. These things never end well. So yes, I was here in Chongqing during the summer、um, with all the equipment,、uh, all sitting here looking at me, while at the same time Eric was stranded back at home in Ireland. He returned to China after a one-month delay and was quarantined until mid-September.、Um, we should have him tell us about the whole travel ordeal again. That was around the time I started a new job, and I was trying to figure that out, that whole thing out. And I admit there was a bit of unproductivity thrown into the mix. But between that and our continued lockdown disruption in China over the last couple of months, it hasn't really been easy to knuckle down. That happens. Call it a hiatus. Yeah, let's call it a hiatus.、Um, sure, doesn't every great artist of one form or, or another? Don't they all take hiatuses at some point in their career? I know. I've had many. And does it work for you? Clearly,、uh, can't you see? Yeah, any budding artists in Chongqing and elsewhere in China, for that matter, they would have had plenty of time to devote to their work over the last month in these strange days. What a time to be alive! Yeah, what a time to be alive! For me, it is like to be in a war time, and every day you are worrying about there is not enough food to eat. And also, you get tested positive, and you have to、uh, be taken to the hospitals to quarantine. And those places doesn't have a good condition, and there are a lot of people waiting for going to the single, the one, the one toilet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a huge buildings that they built、um, that kind of fit like twenty thousand people. Twenty thousand people with coronavirus all locked into one building. Like I hadn't been in lockdown since the very start of the pandemic, and to tell you the truth, I didn't think I'd ever need to go through that experience again. In a way, it is nice to just sit around home and and do nothing. It is nice,、uh, but sometimes you feel like you want to go out and running around. Yeah. Or go to the rooftop and drink wine in the afternoon,、um, but there comes a point when you start to ask the question, "When will it end?" Because everywhere around us, we saw these pop-up testing booths, and we saw more and more Dabai, and Dabai being the, the the guys with the white coats that test you, and we heard about new COVID recovery facilities being built overnight, and. It it really does become exhausting when when this is your reality. Yeah, a distorted reality. 
It's like a nightmare that you can never awaken from. Yeah, it's terrible for mental health. Zero COVID has also resulted in non-COVID deaths, including suicide as well as fatal tragedies. And you were telling me about the conversation you had back home uh, after the bus crash in Guizhou uh, in September. Yes, I was、uh, having a conversation with my mother, and she said you cannot blame the COVID policies because accidents happens all the time. Yeah, twenty-seven people died that night, and every single one of them was a needless death. Which takes us onto the apartment building fire in Urumqi in Xinjiang. Yeah, now that's awful stuff,、um, and a tragedy. That sparked a backlash not only in Urumqi but in multiple cities、um, right across the country. Wherever you're listening to this podcast, I'm sure you've heard about it. The fire and the protests that followed were headline news right around the world. These were the kind of protests, the likes of which I've never witnessed in my 12 years in China. Me neither, and we need to rewind a few decades to the last time so much anger engulfed the nation. In the immediate aftermath of the fire, people in Urumqi confronted officials over their neglect of the residents living in the apartment building, verified videos of them pulling down barricades and calling for an end to restrictions when mainstream. Yeah, there was a great photo of one of the protesters standing above the crowd, hoisting the Chinese flag. It was visually stunning, and it reminded me of something out of、uh, out of a history textbook. Yes, you could really get a sense from those images of the enormity and importance of the occasion. It's mad that at the point people in the city had been locked down for one hundred days. I struggle to even comprehend that level of control. It's extraordinary power to hold, and an extraordinary torment to endure. Officials in Urumqi denied that the lockdown was responsible for the loss of life, which is incredibly insulting to the people who died and to their families also. You look at the videos that were shared online, and it's clear to see that fire services. Were unable to access compound because of a policy blockade at the community gates. Yeah, incredible comments to make. Although they did eventually apologize, but it was too little, too late at that stage. As in circumstances not seen for a long time in China, people united in anger and protest. Turning on their heads of their local authorities to demand the lifting of zero COVID restrictions and censorship laws too. People finally felt the need to make their resentment known. Yeah, and this gave way to the white paper revolution, where demonstrators held up blank A4 pieces of paper to show their dissatisfaction.、Um, it's a cool idea, holding up a blank sheet of paper. Yeah, the absence of words kind of reflects the removal of comments online by censors. It's a good one, all right.、Um, now, protesters had initially held up white sheets of A4 paper as a symbol of mourning, as white is the color of death and mourning in Chinese culture, which is also interesting to me. Yes, close relatives of the deceased often wear white clothing. And white banners are hung over the door of a household to show that a death has occurred. Yeah, and that's how it began. But then these ordinary sheets of white paper, they became a symbol of defiance against state censorship. Plus, it's a practical way to evade censorship. That was until M and G stationery halted the sale of white paper. That is, now. I can't say with any assurance that it actually did happen, but a stamp statement by the company did circulate online, which claimed that that was indeed what happened. Banning the color of peace in order to keep the peace. Yeah, it's ironic, isn't it? 
It's a powerful tool in a way, as it gave voice to the voiceless while not intending to be provocative. Yeah, but then those images of silent, mainly peaceful demonstrations. They led to an overnight crackdown as those dastardly censors began whitewashing, which is a nice pun, um, images from the internet. And from there, protests took on a life of its own, uh, spreading to cities, including notably, uh, well, Shanghai, uh, Chengdu, Hangzhou, Guangzhou, Lanzhou. Now, we're not going to repeat ourselves by relaying the events of the last week. If you want to listen to what happened in Shanghai, please see our previous recording in which I spoke to Mick about his experience down Wulamatree Way, where the bulk of protests and clashes with the police occurred. And it is a good one. Instead, let's discuss the role of smart technology as a means of organization and protest. The same night as the demonstrations in Wulamatree, WeChat users shared videos of the demonstrations and sounds like, do you hear the people saying from the, uh, the Mise Hop, get up, stand up by Bob Marley and Patti Smith's power to the people. And it's the second time this year in China that the Les Miserables song has been used in this way. It's a popular misconception in the West that Chinese people are not allowed to protest. They are, and they do. And it happens far more often than you might think. Usually, it comes in the form of a straight demonstration. Let's say that people have some grievance over unsuitable contract conditions or insurance or that kind of thing, you know. In this instance, people will gather outside the entrance to the company holding a long banner with Chinese characters or Hanzi written across it. These protests are usually orderly and well managed, sometimes policed, but mostly don't end in arrest or violence. Rather, with the protest leaders discussing the issue with their employer or aggressor, whether or not the problem is resolved is another thing. But unlike these protests, the ones that have gripped China in recent days were organized through and spread by the use of smartphones and social media. China has made almighty advances in technology over the past couple of decades. Yet the government has used censorship and surveillance to strike a balance between embracing technology while limiting citizen power at the same time. In the words of the police frontman Sting, every move you make, I'll be watching you. Think about it. A smartphone is essentially a tracking and surveillance device. Without them, implementing a policy as rigid as zero COVID, it wouldn't have been possible. This is the premise of George Orwell's 1984, and it's being enacted right now. And it's scary in a way. Yeah, it is scary. Uh, people's movements were tied to the color of their digital health code, their travel code and venue code. And I think people grew wary of scanning their codes multiple times a day. All that being said, it took days for Chinese censors to stamp out unfavorable content due to their sheer volume. Um, and by then, of course, these images coming from China, they'd gone all over the world. Which also proves that if we really want to, Chinese people will find a way over the Great Firewall. And it goes some way to dispelling the belief in the West that Chinese people are totally repressed, or at least information-wise. Not the case at all. They have the best of gear, uh, better than most countries. They know what's going on and they know a whole lot more about what's going on in their country than you do. The Great Firewall, by the way, is the nickname given by the censorship, given to the censorship body that prohibits access to websites such as Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. 
or to the world's biggest search engine, Google, which is banned in China. The only way to circumvent the firewall is to use a, a VPN, a virtual private network, for those of you who don't know what a VPN is. Yeah, VPNs are widely available here and locals are becoming ever more savvy as to the strengths of using them. It's easy for a Chinese person to buy one and install, but the main problem is that they are banned. Well, you say they're banned, but there's no like VPN police going around handing out fines or arresting people in the dead of night for sharing baby photos. Um, at least that doesn't happen 99% of the time. Don't take that figure at face value, by the way. I just made it up. But it is it is the case that you never hear of anyone getting into trouble for it. Yeah, once in a blue moon, it might happen. Or a red moon. Why a red moon? Well, you know, because China, red moon rises. That's a good name for a book on Chinese um, colony, I think. Yeah. Who's to say I'm not writing it already? I like economics. So it seems like users of WeChat and Weibo didn't care too much about the kind of content they posted alongside the protests. For the first time ever on this scale, social media was being used to push party boundaries. Like, there were plenty of instances where people said, Oh, I know of such and such a person who has been posting things under WeChat. And that's so out of character. Um, it was as if there was an overnight confidence that took the country by storm. People were no longer concerned with the consequences of public commentary. And more seasoned organizers, they turned to Western platforms like Instagram and Twitter to spread the word. Chinese citizens' familiarity with censorship and how to avoid it helped propel the protests and perhaps helped provide inspiration for their enduring symbol, being the white paper revolution, as well as much tried and tested usage of pawns and memes. Protesters adopt censorship invasion techniques, such as posting screenshots instead of text, or adding filters to videos before sharing to sidestep automated dictation systems. Code lo coded language was also used to discuss events online. And it worked until the inevitable clampdown, of course, which was happening when the surveillance hand was dealt. Let's call it surveillance retaliation. Yeah, there were reports that police gathered um, location data from smartphones and question anyone present in the area at the time. Random people were also stopped by police on the street or on public transport and had their phones searched for any comments, any images or videos uh, that were made concerning the protests. Search terms related to the protests began to disappear from WeChat and Weibo platforms as public anger it slowly quietened. All the while, the censorship machine, it remained in super high gear. Having trouble with your VPN lately? Well, that's why. State censorship even found its way to World Cup. Dissatisfaction with lockdown conditions had been simmering before any protest, as Chinese citizens publicly pointed out the complete absence of masks and social distancing in Qatar. A stark contrast to their own situation. Chongqing residents in particular were quick to highlight how, before their very eyes, the rest of the world were reveling in the fruits of post-COVID. One man in the city voiced his frustrations to British broadcaster Sky News, while another went to a 15-minute long run to Chongqing authorities. Both men were in lockdown and both men referenced to the World Cup. CCTV is the name of the Chinese state broadcaster and CCTV5 is its sports channel. For the first few days of the World Cup coverage, all appeared normal. But then suddenly, the fans went missing. Well, 
maybe apart from the odd one or two shots on the TV. And you're thinking to yourself, yeah, OK, there must be a valid reason for that, right? But then some people starting putting up stadium footage from one broadcaster alongside the CCTV coverage. And what do you know? It was different. The fans were absent on CCTV, which was obviously noticeable any time a goal was scored. Fan celebrations? Nope. You're not allowed to see what joy and happiness looks like. Now, people will argue, yes, but we could see the crowd at all times. You absolutely could, but mainly only long shots or background shots during replays. I watch a lot of football, and so does Eric. Han watches a bit of football, and she plays it too, uh, pretty well. There's no mistake about it. The footage shown to Chinese citizens on CCTV was manipulated. But why? Why remove close-ups of fans? There can only be one reason. Masks. Or the lack of them. Don't give Chinese people something to complain about. But then the protest happened and the government found itself with bigger fish to fry. Close-up shots of fans at the World Cup magically reappeared afterwards. Which kind of proves that they were intentionally removed. And speaking of masks, do you remember that guy in the park before lockdown who stopped and told us to wear our masks? I do. And I'll point out as well that we were amongst the 80% of people that day who weren't wearing one. Yeah, so I found out something really cool about why he might have been worried. All right, go on. It seems like he was worried because um, if we have COVID and he would be punished because we have COVID. Since we are in the same community, which reminds me of a very old and cruel Chinese system back in ancient China, if a family member has commit a crime that the whole family has to be executed. Yeah, so it's kind of like um, the party has became the family. So now if one person commits a crime, then everybody is punished. Yeah, then he, he will be punished. That's yeah. why he told us to wear masks. Yeah. Um, so that's it. Um, we'll wrap it up there, I think. One final word before we go. Uh, Jiang Zemin died. Jiang Zemin was the former leader of the Chinese Communist Party, um, of course. Um, but he was lauded in many circles for his policies of reform and opening up. Han, do you remember anything of him when you were growing up? I remember seeing him on TV pretty often. And to be honest, there's not much to say because he's always a perfect president standing in front of a lot of people and he has his uh, three representatives, uh, the, the thoughts of three representatives or something. Okay, so if you're listening to us from China, make sure to stock up on plenty of medicine and nucleic acid kits. And I'm sure, as you're all aware now, zero COVID is on its last legs and people are going to get sick. And that's the inevitability of finally opening up. We've got to take the hit and get back to living, I say. Han, do you have any parting words before we sign off? Anything you'd like to say in Chinese? She just told you all to fuck off, by the way. Liar. Okie dokie. Um, we leave you go. Be safe. Talk to you all next time. Toodles.